we've been going through the Jesus storybook as a church, which means that's where we're taking our text or our topics from. And then in our small groups, children and students and even adults are talking about the same subject every week. And then we preach on that in the service. And we just believe that that at least ought to stimulate spiritual conversations in the home as well as in other places, whether it's school or workplaces or restaurants. It's our attempt to at least uh, provide you an easy tool to do what we're supposed to be doing anyway, which is making disciples. So we hope that people are taking advantage of that. We've heard some good reports of those kind of conversations that are going on. John the Baptist is indeed a unique person in biblical history uh, for a variety of different reasons. One is people almost don't know how to categorize him. Uh, we're so used to just opening up our New Testament and seeing him that we think New Testament, but yet his role seems to be that of an Old Testament prophet. And so where does he land in all that? And it's probably both. He is indeed a prophet. You could probably call him the last of those type of prophets. But yet he's also the, the first one in the, that we read in the New Testament to, to herald or proclaim the good news that the kingdom has come, that Jesus is here, that the rule and reign of God is now among us. So I've heard and seen some commentators that actually said he's the bridge between that Old Testament uh, prophet era and the New Testament proclaiming that Jesus is here. So that in itself makes him unique. In the first part of Luke chapter 1, we, we hear the story or see the story of John being baptized, not baptized, John being born to Zechariah and Elizabeth. And we find out that they were godly people. The Bible uses the word blameless. That doesn't mean sinless because we know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But they were blameless. They were faithful. They were followers of God. And yet they lived in a broken world. And so we need to be reminded that even though we're followers of the Lord Jesus, that doesn't remove the brokenness of this world. They lived in a time where even the children of Israel had not really heard a word from the Lord in some 400 years. It's called the silent years sometimes, that time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so it was broken in even a religious sense. It was also broken in, in their mind probably. Back in this day, it was... Um, it was almost catastrophic if you didn't have a child because your children literally were the ones that took care of you. There wasn't any government programs or things like that. And so Zechariah and Elizabeth didn't have a child. And so in that sense, they probably felt broken in some ways. And, and just kind of society in general, they were under Roman occupation and uh, just a very secular, worldly, broken world they were living in. But hope was coming. The same rescuer that we've been seeing through the Jesus storybook all this time, the promised deliverer, is indeed coming. John the Baptist was going to prepare the way through all the different brokenness. As I was thinking about even the title of this story, Heaven Breaking Through and, and realizing that Jesus was coming into a broken world, uh, it reminded me of, of the hope. I got an email, I guess, yesterday from some of you may know uh, Don Moore and uh, his wife, Nita Moore. Some of you have been praying for him, lives in a different part of the state, but very godly couple. And she had been fighting really terminal illness for, for several years. And she had passed away. And the email that he got said, number one, thank your church for praying. But then he had some lines in there that just showed his maturity and his hope in the gospel. He said, it's been an honor, number one, to get to take care. And the way he worded it was get to take care of God's lamb. Talking about his wife. Getting to take care of God's lamb for the last three years. So that definitely shows some maturity. And then he said, even though I'm, a, I'm by myself and I'm alone, I'm so glad that she's with him instead of with me. That's understanding the gospel. That's understanding that heaven has broke through. So that we can have a, a hope, a biblical certainty that the rest of the world doesn't have. The rest of the world that's searching for this kind of peace that Brother Don showed in his email, they're searching in all the wrong places. They're searching for material things. They're searching for 
maybe human relationships to solve that. They're searching for athletic achievements or musical achievements or different things to fill that void. And that void can only be filled by the Son of God, Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, as the angel's coming to tell Zechariah about this coming child, John the Baptist, it says, The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Now, we don't know based on, on that verse if this was a lifelong Nazarite vow. That happened in the Old Testament with people like Samson and people like Samuel. It's possible that this was a Nazarite vow, or it's also possible that this child was just going to be separate and, and purely and wholly devoted to the Lord. So don't read into it necessarily more than we know, but a lot of commentators do think that this was a lifelong Nazarite vow. Verse 16, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. John the Baptist, we're going to see in a minute, didn't see himself as the Elijah to come. Certainly he wasn't literally Elijah. There was the common thought amongst the people of Israel that since Elijah didn't die a physical death, that since he was just taken to heaven, that he was going to come back to kind of usher in the kingdom of God. So that was naturally on the people's mind, but we're going to see from John the Baptist's answer, he denied that. And we're going to learn, or we won't see in our text today, but Jesus later on kind of helped explain that to say to his disciples, hey, Elijah really did come in a sense. He, he came, when John the Baptist came in the power of Elijah, doing basically the mission of Elijah, proclaiming in, in a very similar method and probably very similar dress as Elijah did. Some stern things, but yet hopeful things that Jesus is indeed coming Let's look, take a look at John's preaching style in Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We don't hear that word very often anymore. It is in some ways, it's a church word, but it's a very biblical word, and I guess it's okay if we don't use it, but we can't get rid of the concept for sure. We need to probably teach the language, but even if we're not going to teach the language, we have to teach the concept because it's biblical and it's part of salvation. Repentance is turning from sin and self and turning to the Lord God. It's, it's a radical slash biblical change in your lifestyle. It's specifically when you're not only turning from sin, you're forsaking it and saying, no more, with God's help, I'm done with that. He's going to change me from the inside out, and I'm going to run to him instead of running away from him, which is our natural human bent. But we're not only turning and forsaking sin, we're turning to him. So we're turning from something, but we're turning to something better. We're turning to Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the fountain of joy, the fountain of hope. That's repentance. If you have felt guilt and shame for your sin and maybe even purpose to pull up your bootstraps and not do certain sins again, understand while that's admirable in some ways and, you know, the world will give you a hand clap for trying to stop that bad habit, understand that that's not biblical repentance. Lost people all over the place feel guilty for their behavior and shame for their behavior. And many of them try to stop their behavior. And many of them will go into a certain program even to stop a behavior. But that's behavior modification. That's not repentance. Repentance. God grants you the ability to turn from sin and self and to turn to him and to run to him. And it creates a radical change. But notice the order 
of this. There's, there's a heart change that allows you to repent, which then allows your behavior to change. It's not, I'm going to change my behavior, and then maybe I'll grant, get some favor from God, and then I'll turn. No, God gives you the ability to turn and run to him, and then your behavior starts to change. You're not going in that direction anymore. You're going in his direction. And that's the kind of preaching John was doing. That's the kind of preaching we need to be doing. In fact, if you're, maybe you're visiting here today, and you're saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to visit many churches, and, and we encourage that. But just be sure when you get there that they're preaching the whole counsel of God. That God is love, and he's full of mercy and grace, and he sent Jesus, his son, down to this earth to die on a cruel cross to pay for your sins, to provide salvation for you, the only way of salvation. But understand, he is the only way of salvation, and to fully trust in him means you're not trusting in yourself anymore, and you are really turning from yourself and turning to God, and there will be life change as a part of that. God will indeed change your heart, start giving you his desires. John was preaching, repent. And in Matthew 3, verse 2, as he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew's the only one that uses that term. The other gospel writers use terms like the kingdom of God, and they're interchangeable, but understand it means, guess what? what all these prophets have been preaching about, it's here. The rule and reign of God through his son, Jesus Christ, is here. Now it'll be ultimately fulfilled in the second coming, but it's, it's at hand. It started the time has come, Galatians 4.4 4 says, at just the right time, God sent his son. This is the kingdom of heaven that he's talking about. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. I hadn't really thought about that little phrase there, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. In terms of, I'd always thought about it, but okay, they're, they're letting us know this is John the Baptist that's fulfilling this. They're letting us know that um, that's his job, that's his role, and it is. But I hadn't thought about it until I read this week. It also is a big deal that it's, it's showing that not only is John the Baptist the proclaimer, it's saying that Jesus is the Lord. And so there could have been at that point any number of people, they're looking for the Messiah. They don't know who it is. And this text is saying, yes, John the Baptist is the proclaimer, but Jesus is the one he's proclaiming. Jesus is indeed the Lord. So it's a big deal in both ways. And when you see the phrase, make his path straight, we, we know in theory we're talking about preparing the way of the Lord, but it meant a big deal to these people. And that's why it's important as you observe the text that you know, may, in fact, more importantly than what it might mean to us is what it meant back then. That helps us know what it means to us. And back then, when they saw make his path straight, they understood it to mean that, hey, when a king was coming somewhere, and this sounds a little spoiled, and I guess it is, they would actually clear a path, make a straight road, make it where it's not bumpy, it's not muddy, it's not going to, the king's not going to get stuck, all those kind of things. They're going to make a, as best they can, a really nice straight road for the king. And so they're saying that's what John the Baptist's call is to do prepare the people for their king. So it probably did mean more to them than it does when we just fly over that and read it. Verse 4, now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. By the way, we, you know, saw the cartoon graphic of that, but this wasn't totally uncommon for nomads in this day. He was out in the Judean desert not your place for the coat and tie, not your place for just the fancy dancy clothes of palaces. This was what nomads would wear. And as we saw, nomads also have a little different diet than the people that are in palaces as well. His food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. This sounds a little strange. He's out in the desert. He doesn't look like your normal rabbi of that day that people would attach themselves to to try to work themselves up on the social ladder of that day to get them more privilege and more status. He certainly didn't look like that. He wasn't in 
cool, comfortable places, preaching his message. He was out in the desert. And yet when the supernatural got involved, people still came to hear. Some of them with good motives, and we're going to see in a minute, some of them with not so good motives. But this was a big deal, going a long way to an uncomfortable place to hear some really good news. And verse 6 says, And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, I had never really paid attention to why this was quite such a big deal, but it's a huge deal. Keep in mind that baptism, John the Baptist wasn't the first to baptize. Baptism had been going on before, but before it had been baptizing Gentiles like us into Judaism. In other words, if you want to become a Jew, come get baptized. They would be saying, we're special, so if you want to become one of the special Jews, come be baptized. In our society, it would be like saying, if you want to be an American, come get baptized. You don't have the privilege of being an American, so if you want to be one, come get baptized. So it would be a really big deal for John the Baptist then to say, I know you're a Jew, but guess what? That doesn't accomplish anything. We're going to baptize you showing that you know you're a sinner and that you need to turn to God, that your national identity doesn't get you anything. This is kind of a radical slash biblical message that John the Baptist is giving. And make no mistake, that's exactly what he's doing. He's saying, your country of origin does you no good whatsoever. A polite way of saying it is you could bust hell wide open with your little Jewish flag and your little Jewish card in hand. Does you no good. Now the safe place would be for me to hush, but we're not going to be safe today. Let's take it one little step further. Same thing for America. In fact, if any country could land on their identity to maybe make them safe, if you're going to pick one, it would be Israel. But they've made it quite clear here and many other places that that does them no good whatsoever. So don't think for a second that us waving our flags is going to do us any good. There will be, hell will be full of Jews and Americans, and I guess in some respects, every tongue and tribe and people group will be represented there as well. Here's what John the Baptist said to these folks as he was baptizing the ones who were sincere, the ones who realized that being a Jew wouldn't get them to heaven. He baptized them, but guess what? That drew a crowd. Here come some religious folks who were thinking that their national identity was enough. They wanted to come check this out because there was an unauthorized teacher named John the Baptist doing unauthorized things, baptizing Jews. And the, the religious people are thinking, why in the world would you baptize somebody that's already a national treasure of God. So John the Baptist sees them coming, Pharisees and the Sadducees. By the way, the Pharisees were the experts in religious law. They had the Old Testament pretty much memorized, and they were so much the expert that they had even written hundreds and thousands of things to explain it, to add on to it. And then the Sadducees were the rich religious people. They had kind of partnered with Rome, and they wanted peace, and they kind of controlled things in the temple. Can't we just get along? We got it good going on. We're getting rich. Why are we going to push back? Let's, let's work things out with the Romans and just keep doing our thing. Pharisees and Sadducees didn't really get along except in one area. They hated Jesus. So they kind of combined. They got unified about that. So they came out to check out John the Baptist. Surely this nice preacher seeing some rich people coming, surely what he's going to do is say, ah, we're going to... We're going to mute down our preaching a little bit because some of y'all, if y'all joined our church and tithe, we would be in good shape. So I'm going to be sweet and just tell y'all, okay, kind of believe what you want to believe. Play along with us if you can, but I'm not going to preach very hard to y'all. You got money. Ah, that's not what John the Baptist did. Look at verse 7. When he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers. How does that do for... Finance committee isn't going to like that if I see a rich person come in and go, you brood of vipers. It doesn't keep people very long unless they happen to be a follower of Jesus. In which case, they know they're not a brood of vipers under that condition. They know they're a child of the king. 
So when you hear this kind of preaching from John the Baptist or me or anybody else, if the shoe doesn't fit, you don't have to put it on. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you're depending on riches or wealth or power or nationality or anything else, then the shoe fits you. And John the Baptist said, for all those who are depending on anything else besides Jesus, you're a brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Verse 8, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to raise up these stones, or God is able to take these stones and raise up children of Abraham. That's an amazing text. He just got real specific with them. You've been leaning on Abraham. Here's the deal. God can take these rocks and just pick up children of Abraham. No problem whatsoever. Paul does explain it even further in different places, in Romans and Galatians. He says, no, no, the true children of Abraham are the ones that have the faith of Abraham, not the ones that have the law that have tried to follow the law because you can't follow the law. So he's saying God can raise up children of Abraham from rocks. That doesn't mean anything. Same thing with Americans. God can raise up that if he wanted to. The children of Israel, by the way, just as a reminder from history, the reason they were called out in the first place was to reach the nations. That was their assignment. God even said it wasn't because you were anything special at all. You were the least. You were the weakest. I called you out basically so I can get glory as you accomplish my mission. And then they decided not to accomplish his mission. So we could have debate back and forth on how much America has been called out and blessed and those kind of things. That's perception different by different people. But I'll tell you this, to the extent it has been blessed, God has blessed it not because it's America. He has blessed it so we'll go reach the nations for the world for Christ. Every tongue, every tribe, every people group. And to the extent we don't reach the world for Christ, he'll he'll find somebody else. He's God. That's the way he works. He's looking for individuals and families and churches and nations who have a heart like his to reach the world for Christ. There's nothing inherent about any nation that gets his blessing. It's people. It's it's lost people that need to hear the gospel. And who's going to be the vessel for that? What individual, what family, what church, what nation is going to go tell the world about Jesus? His feel-good sermon continues in verse 10 as he's talking to the religious elite that counted on their national identity. He says, even now the axe is laid at the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. He was dealing with their nationalistic idolatry. And that's, that's really, I guess, all over the world. It's certainly here. People that tend to go beyond just giving honor. The Bible says we can give honor to whom honor is due. And so there are times, yes, we, we honor the commitment and sacrifice of, of soldiers and, and their families and things like that, and we do. But there's a difference between honor and worship. Worship is designed for King Jesus. That's who we exalt. That's who we worship. He's saying don't depend on your nationality. Once you become a true follower of Jesus, you have a new citizenship. It's in heaven. You have a new identity, it's a child of the king. You have a new mission and purpose. It's to tell the good news, it's to make disciples. You're now a temporary resident of this home, of this earth in general, and this country in particular. This is your temporary dwelling. If you're a follower of Jesus, your permanent dwelling is with your king. In fact, your role is an ambassador for your king. That's what you do, and John has made it quite clear to his his people, the Jews, that they don't need to trust in their national identity. They need to trust in the coming one, Jesus. Verse 11, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So you see probably three different kinds of baptism there. Water baptism, showing that outward sign of that inward transformation, turning from sin, turning to God. He's telling us Jesus is coming, and soon you'll be baptized with the Spirit. All believers now, once you trust in the finished work of Christ, you get the Holy Spirit. 
And then the baptism of fire, there's a little debate there, but probably referring to the final judgment. It could also be indicating the purifying refiner's fire, even for believers. But certainly getting baptized into a national identity is not what he's talking about. Verse 12, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Jews who came out to hear John the Baptist, in general, obviously there were some who converted and repented and confessed, but in general they would have been shocked and angered that John was calling for personal repentance, personal trust, instead of leaning on anything else, including a national heritage. And you might say, well, that's, that's mighty tough preaching, and it is. It's mind-blowing. It shows you the supernatural side of things, that people were coming in droves to a really bad facility, which is no facility, and to really bad weather, to hear a really gruff man, but tell the good news of God, which is, and it is good news, Turn from your junk and turn to the loving, living, all-powerful, all-wise God. That's good news. And somehow Satan has convinced us that turning from our junk and turning to God is a bad thing. And he mentioned it months ago when he talked about how did Satan hijack the word repentance. It's not a bad word. It's a positive word. If you think about, I'm I'm on the road, the broad road that leads to hell, and I'm on a turn to the narrow road that leads to life, anything describing that is good news. John said, repent. You say, well, he, thank goodness that was a one-time deal with that kind of preaching. Wrong. <laughs> Matthew 23, 33, here's how Jesus said it. You're thinking, surely my blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus softened up that message a little bit. He had been talking to the Pharisees, same group John was talking to about being hypocrites and described all the ways they had been hypocrites, and he concluded with this, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Again, this is the one who, they would win the Bible drill. They could knock it out at the Bible B. They had the Old Testament memorized. They even knew how to dress for church. They had all the outward signs. Problem was, they didn't have an inward heart transformation. And Jesus said, you're a brood of vipers, you're a brood of snakes, you're, you're going to be condemned to hell. Your religion gets you nowhere, your nation gets you nowhere, you haven't had a heart change. You're depending on the wrong things. In John chapter 1, people came to ask John the Baptist who he was. You can imagine they were, the religious elite were concerned, it says this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? So again, this is, in their minds, an unauthorized teacher with probably unauthorized teaching. So that's a legitimate question from those who were charged with keeping the religious confines, keeping everybody in the box. So they said, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, well, what then? Basically, well, what what are you doing? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So he said to them, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I'm the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. There's that Old Testament prophecy again. As the prophet Isaiah said, basically he's saying, I'm just called to proclaim and prepare this country to understand their Messiah, their deliverer is coming. Verse 24 of John 1, now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing? If you're not, if you're neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet, John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am unworthy or not worthy to untie. By the way, that's a big statement. Back in the day when people would attach themselves to their rabbis to learn and, again, to work their way up the social ladder, 
they would basically do almost anything for their rabbi. They, they could do menial tasks, even if they were really smart guys. Once they hooked onto a rabbi, if he shook his tea glass, they went to get tea. Whatever he needed doing, they did, except the Jewish, basically Jewish instruction said, you don't have to lower yourself and mess with anybody's feet. And you can imagine why. Dusty roads, animals have been on the road. Even, even a Jewish slave didn't have to mess with people's feet much less these people that were kind of attached and learning to a rabbi. So this is a big deal when John says, not only would I be willing to untie his sandals, I'm not even worthy to do that. He's so incredible and I'm so nothing. This is this Jesus who is coming. This is the Messiah who's coming. Verse 28, these things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And again, for us, this creates a totally different picture. That's why, again, with observation, interpretation, we need to go back to what did this mean to the original audience? For us, and I think, I don't, who knows with all the pictures we got up, but I'm thinking we're guilty in our household too. We got the little Jesus holding the lamb too. And so when we see the lamb of God, that's what we think. Oh, man, isn't that sweet? That's not what they thought. They've seen sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice where the lamb gets taken by the family and gets its neck cut as it's sacrificed. They've seen blood. They've seen gore. So when they see, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, this isn't a sweet little aha moment. This is probably tears. This is probably in some ways repulsive, but it's still a hallelujah moment because of the end of that who takes away the sin of the world. That's an awesome thing to think away about taking away our sin, but don't miss this little phrase in there that's a big deal that the Jews had missed for a long time, the sin of the world. Not just, hey, we're just here to redeem Israel. We're just here to take care of Israel. No, just like we told you back in Genesis, you're supposed to be reaching the nations with the good news. The Messiah is coming to take care of the sin of the world, this Lamb of God. Verse 30, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Now when he says he didn't know him, again, we don't know for sure, but the odds are since they were related and didn't live too far apart, he probably knew Jesus. Now again, we're having to kind of surmise that but he probably knew Jesus. Likely he's saying, I didn't know he was the Messiah. We played football together. Somehow he always won, but I still didn't know he was the Messiah. Never got hurt. I still didn't know he was the Messiah, but I didn't know him. But he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. You don't think that's a big deal in the service if you've come out to hear John the Baptist and he said, hey, one coming who's greater than I, and they might have been going, yeah, 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 yeah. But then all of a sudden he goes, this guy is the son of God. That's a big deal. It ought to be a big deal to us. Altogether different, altogether holy, one to be worshiped, one not to be trifled with, one to give up everything for, not one to just add to your life. He is Jesus. He is king. Verse 35 of John 1, the next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Won't take that point too far, but hey, if we were proclaiming that Jesus is God, Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords, if that's what we talked about, if that's what we were about in life, there would be some who would get interested and follow him. Most of your friends, most of your coworkers, most of your other students probably don't even know that you're a follower of Jesus, and it's sure not on our mouth all the time. There's, that's, a, that's a statement that's going to require a response. Jesus is the Son of God, the only way to heaven. That kind of conversation will require somebody to either say, you're a nut, I don't want to be around you, or they might say, tell me more. I want to know how to follow this Jesus. Either way, that's an okay conversation. And again, we do it with love, and we hopefully have a little bit of tact about it. But 
don't not do it. We need to have those conversations with people that Jesus is Lord. He is indeed the Son of God. John 3, verse 26. They came to John and said, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing, and all are going to him. Boy, can't you? It just, human nature never changes, does it? It's like, I know you said he was the Son of God, but come on, John, something's wrong. Everybody's leaving us and going to him. We're never going to have a mega church if everybody keeps going to Jesus. John, of course, not upset about that. Verse 27, John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given to him from heaven. Don't you notice the mature, godly contentment in John? His, his followers didn't quite have it yet, but it's been said that if we're discontent, especially in this case, he's talking about gifts that have been given from God, the place we've been assigned, the role we've been assigned. It's been said that if we're discontent with that, it shows not only lack of maturity, it shows some arrogance. John was quite content with his role. His followers had to kind of catch on to that. Verse 28, you yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. You've heard Paul's statements in other places. The church bringing the bride of Christ says that the one who has the bride, he's the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, in other words, he's talking about like a best man type situation. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. And then notice verse 30, a pretty famous verse, but we need to we need to take it to our own heart. He must increase. I must decrease. That's for individuals. That's for you. That's for your family. That's for your job. That's for your hobby. That's for your ego. That's for your church. Emmanuel must decrease in the sense of thinking it's all about us. He must increase. If we don't do anything else, we just keep driving that point home. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's all about him. It's not about, doesn't that change everything? Even as far as our preferences or anything else, not about me. It's all about him. Take it to heart. We must decrease. He must increase. And then the very difficult situation we saw portrayed on the video, Jesus comes to John to be baptized, Matthew 3, 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan of John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so for now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Again, a lot of debate over what that means. We could probably give some decent suggestions. Some think that it possibly had to do with affirming John and John the Baptist and his ministry. I think that at best is some of the least of the reasons of what he was doing to fulfill all righteousness. I do think there was probably an element of it that was modeling for us what it looks like. He, Jesus came, in a sense, to identify with sinful humanity. He took our sins upon him on the cross. So there's an element of modeling to us. There's also the just identifying with the people he came to save. There's also the element of the beautiful picture, which we talk about every time we baptize, the picture of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And in the future, ourselves, we're buried with Christ in baptism. We're raised to walk in newness in life, a new creature. So he's given us that great illustration. And then also just the opportunity to publicly be verified by God the Father that this is a big deal. This is indeed Jesus. So fulfilling all righteousness. Then John consented. Verse 16, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he came up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased. Again, this is a really big deal. The Son of God, the only Son of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, 
so that whoever would believe in him, trust in him, and have eternal life, they don't have to perish. The Son of God is a big deal. He's well pleased. He's acknowledging that this is my boy. This is, this is the one who's been with us from eternity past. We've been together. We've had perfect fellowship, perfect love, and yet I'm giving my son. And yet the Bible tells us, too, that there's an element of Jesus voluntarily came and laid his life down. He said, nobody takes my life. I'm laying it down. That's not the only time, by the way, that we see God saying this. At the Mount of Transfiguration, in Matthew 17, it says, after Jesus, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. By the way, side note, sometimes people get a little antsy when people start small groups and start making disciples, and they go, well, that's not fair. It's supposed to be for all of us. Well, no, Jesus preached to the masses, but then he also had the 12 he spent a lot of time with, and then he also took Peter, James, and John a little further still. And so that's just how discipleship works. That's just part of the deal. He took them with him to the Mount of Transfiguration. He probably saw something in them. And he was transfigured before them, verse 2. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. By the way, this is a big deal. Moses represented the law. He was one of the heroes of the faith. He was part of their Mount Rushmore, of their identity as a, as a nation. So Moses came representing the law. Elijah came representing the prophets, one of the greatest prophets. So you got the representation of the law, the representation of the prophets, and then you got Jesus, the Messiah. That's an awesome thing for these Peter, James, and John, these Jews to see. You can just have guessed, even if you didn't know it, that Peter was going to open his big mouth probably say something that didn't make much sense. It made sense to him. Verse 4, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we're here. I guess so. He's got the big three. He's got Mount Rushmore right there in front of him. In his mind, it's the big three. It's not the big three in God's mind. Peter said, it's good that we're here. If you wish, I'll make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. You see Peter's warped theology again. Oh, man. My three heroes are here. Let's just make a tent for all of them. Let's, make, let's have a building program. We can do it. It's worth it for these three. Notice, I've never really paid attention to this, but notice this divine interruption in verse 5. He was still speaking. I'd missed that before. He hadn't even got quiet yet. He's still running his old Peter mouth. And God doesn't let him finish. I wish he would do that. I know you're thinking, I wish he would hush you too. <laughs> Right in the middle of saying that, I saw the little things above your head. It just, <laughs> certain of your seats, it just happened, so I know who you are. But while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. So that sounded just like baptism. But then he added one other stretch. Listen to him. That's a big deal. But you got the law over here. God said, no, no, no. Not the law. Listen to Jesus. But, but, but you got the prophet Elijah over here. And he had a bunch of great things to say to predict Jesus is coming. No, 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 no. Don't concentrate on that. Listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Now, again, there's value to those things. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish them. I came to fulfill them. But that's why there's, there's value in gospel gulping and hanging out with Jesus for month after month after month after month. And yes, all Scripture is inspired by God, and I get that. But God said, listen to him. This is my son. Love like he loves. Forgive like he forgives. Walk like he walks. Think like he thinks. And you say, we can't do that. Yes, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you. And we're still going to mess up in those kind of things. But the Holy Spirit of God is in you, and we ought to be looking more like Jesus every single day. As we hang out in the Word, as we pray for a filling of the Spirit, we ought to be the fragrance of Christ wherever we go. Heaven has broken through indeed. And for those of you who are followers of Jesus, that's a hallelujah moment. For those of you who are not followers of Jesus, we're inviting you this morning to leave the darkness, to turn from this broad road that leads to darkness, and turn and run to the light, which is Christ Jesus. That's the invitation today is come to Jesus. As we say so often, it doesn't mean quit all your bad habits and come to Jesus. 
It means come to Jesus, and he'll take care of it after that. You come just as you are. That's the invitation today. And if you are a follower of Jesus, then the invitation as always is, let's just get focused on the king. Let's throw off everything that entangles, and let's fix our eyes on him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we do love you and praise you and worship your holy name. I thank you for your word, which is powerful and true. I thank you for giving us examples like John the Baptist, who were so focused on proclaiming the message that Jesus has come. And God, we pray that for every true follower of Jesus here, let us be focused on you and your mission, the person and work of Jesus Christ. And God, for those here who may have trusted in religion or may have trusted in nationality or may have trusted in family heritage or may have trusted in good works, I pray you would supernaturally make it clear to them that all those things fall woefully short of heaven, of, of being with God for eternity. Jesus, there's, no, there's salvation in no other name. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. So let today be their day of salvation. And I pray it in his wonderful and powerful name. Amen.